South Africa, we find ourselves in 16 days of activism um, against violence against women and children. And so these ideas and also some of what is being said today also really plays into what we as a country are striving for. So the Clevering Hub uh, was a professor of law at Leiden University, and he is particularly known for his speech on the 26th of November. That was, of course, last year, last week already. So a little bit later, but still in the in the broader sense of which already took place in 1940. And in this speech, the significance is that he protested against the dismissal of Jewish colleagues ordered by the German occupancy. After um, the war, he returned as a professor to Leiden University, uh, which was reopened in 1945. So really significant to see also how the work uh, and the sentiments and the values that Clevering have fought for is still relevant in South Africa and the world today. And so this lecture also really celebrates how can we work towards that and what are the difficult questions that remain for us to answer. After his death, the Clevering Hut Chair was established at Leiden University, and it's as part of this chair that we have the annual lecture that is usually hosted, as I said, around the 26th of November. And in South Africa, we really like to have that face to face. But uh, 2020 uh, gave us a different curveball, but it also gave us an opportunity to now have Sandiso with us in the audience, even if it's a complete different time of uh, the day. So Sandiso, thank you also for joining us today. The lectures are funded by Leiden University and it takes place, as I said, in many places of the world. But for South Africa, this is really for us a flagship to be able to host this together with Leiden and to contribute to our agenda of also uh, working towards social justice um, and education in social justice, significantly um, important in South Africa. So our three speakers this evening, it's wonderful to have you in three locations. This makes me a little bit excited that we have Janina sitting in Leiden. We have, I think you're in Leiden. I'm going to assume that you're in Leiden and not somewhere else in the Netherlands, Janina. We have Sindiso sitting um, at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, and we have Nolindi sitting in uh, my hometown, Cape Town, not my alma mater, but at least my hometown, to join us this evening. So Professor Janina Ubuk is Professor of Law, Governance, Development at Leiden University and has also been spearheading together with us this lecture, um, together with Megan. Dr. Sandiso Manisi Weeks is based at the University of Massachusetts, Boston at the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development. And Nolindi Luwiyu, I always get it wrong, is the Director of Land and Accountability Research Center at the University of Cape Town uh, here in South Africa. So without any further ado, I don't want to waste any more time for this very exciting lecture. Uh, Janina, can I hand this over to you? We still can't hear you. We can see you. Okay, you can hear me now, I think. Let me just very clearly up my PowerPoint. Well, thank you for these words. And um, it's actually quite interesting that Klevinka um, again is being relevant in contemporary uh, Holland as well, um, because there is a whole discussion. Because last week there was a, an issue in, in politics uh, about anti Semitism and fascism. And uh, there's been a response from Leiden professor saying, um, talking about it in the context of Kleveringha and the Kleveringha lecture, uh, which is, is broadly uh, in the newspaper. So it's, it's even still uh, ongoing. Now, I do not see my PowerPoint, so I must be doing something wrong, even though we've done it before. I'm going to try it one more time. Okay. And there it comes. OK, so just before we start on this case of South Africa, I just wanted to briefly tell you that the, the broader topic of um, a resurgence of tradition is um, something that we see uh, quite widely on the continent uh, of Africa. Uh, and when I say resurgence of tradition, I'm referring to um, the fact that numerous African states have uh, enhanced and formalized the position of traditional leaders in constitutions and in their legislation. And to some, this was happening from basically from the 
cities. And to some people, this came as rather as a surprise um, for the reason that after independence, uh, we saw that many African governments tried to rather curtail uh, the power of traditional leaders, um, mainly because they saw them as, as remnants of colonial rule. You recognize that from the South African discussions around uh, in the early 1990s. Um, they, they saw them as dividing their countries into ethnic community, into tribes, right? Um, and does as impediments to modernization and nation building. So this really changed. And in the 1990s, the idea was, you know, no longer the idea was that they would wither away and die, uh, but there would actually be a role for these traditional leaders in contemporary Africa. And here are two uh, pictures also to show that the provincial house of traditional leaders in Pamalanga province, uh, but also a speech by the Asante Hina, the, the king of Ashanti in Ghana, uh, at the UN. Now, um, this contemporary role of traditional leaders is not without its challenges, uh, and these challenges lie in a number of things. Uh, the first one being that the checks and balances on the system have been heavily eroded in the colonial period, in, in South Africa, in the apartheid period as well. Um, and secondly, that of course these systems originally originated in a pre-colonial period, um, and are now to function in very different contexts. Contexts characterized by capitalist economies in a strongly globalized world where resources, natural resources that can be accessed maybe via the gatekeeper of the chief um, are very valuable, but also where traditional authorities and traditional government structures have to function as for part of broader nation states with democratically elected leaders, uh, often alongside democratically elected local government, uh, ostensibly committed to, to inclusiveness regarding women, ethnicity, race, etc. So this, this coming together really um, leads to all kinds of pertinent questions, right? How do non-elect traditional authority structures fit into a democratic state and relate to uh, and coexist with elected uh, decentralized local government structures? Um, can male elderly uh, leadership based on ethnicity, which is still the most common norm in traditional rural systems, can that be reconciled with the idea of inclusive democracy? Um, how do customary justice systems that use to regulate communal resources in pre-capitalist societies, how do they operate in capitalist societies where access to land and natural resources provide huge money-making opportunities? So it's these kind of questions that we want to study today and analyze today by focusing on the case study of South Africa, where, as the flyer said, the ANC government is pursuing an agenda uh, to enhance the power of senior traditional leaders uh, within the still strongly contested tribal boundaries from the apartheid era uh, and giving them quite unchecked, quite extensive powers. So we'll do this in three presentations. We'll start with uh, Cindy Zomnizi Weeks, who will give us a little bit of an idea of the legislative infrastructure on this topic, uh, with a particular focus on the traditional courts bill, about which she has published extensively, um, and then with a focus also on the gender issues within that. And then we'll meet, move to uh, Nolunni uh, Luaya, who uh, discusses these um, issues mainly in the context of large-scale mining and um, community resistance against that, and also the pushback against that community resistance. And then um, I come back and I will place um, this more in the context of rural contestation over traditional leadership and leadership positions um, and how these go together with democratic rights, uh, sort of in the name of custom. So I think we will just move on to uh, Sindizo now. Thank you, Janine. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, I want to start with the proposition that if indeed South Africans are living in a time of neo-apartheid, as Tepo Madlingozi has argued, then nothing renders this argument as self-evident as does the sphere of traditional governance. And so I'm going to spend the 15 minutes that I have setting out the legal infrastructure, as Janine said, um, which supports the traditional governance arrangements that prevail in rural South Africa today um, as background for the presentations that will follow from my, my colleagues. So um, 
In highlighting the implications that these laws have for ordinary people on the ground, uh, I want to place primary emphasis on the impacts they have on women who make up the overwhelming majority of people living in rural areas, roughly 59%, while traditional leadership remains an overwhelmingly male institution, um, uh, sort of over 90% male to be precise. The central argument that I present, um, however, is that the laws that govern traditional communities today are a direct extension of the legal fictions that were instituted by the colonial and apartheid governments during the last century. And this is true, especially as they pertain to fixed imposed tribal boundaries, as well as a centralized authoritarian style of leadership that is accompanied by tremendous decision-making powers over land and conflicts and conflates land as communally administered traditional territory with land as traditional leaders as property, and thereby leaves rural people with no choice as to how to be governed or with very few protections against abuse of power. More than that, you'll see how the government has repeatedly passed or attempted to pass laws that undermine the citizenship rights and democratic protections that ordinary rural people have under the constitution, even when those laws have met with resistance from the public or condemnation from the highest court. So I want to start by setting out the problems that women in rural areas have reported in community consultations and other research and activist spaces. And these are very relevant to the traditional courts bill, um, which as Janine said, is, is has been my primary focus in terms of research and, and, and writing. Um, and so these include women being evicted when their marriages fail or when they become widows, they're evicted from their marital homes. Um, as divorcees or widows, um, women, when they return to their homes of birth, um, they find that they're made unwelcome and they're evicted by their brothers. When they're unmarried, um, as sisters living in their birth family's homes, they're often evicted by their married brothers after their parents die because, you know, brothers as sons assert that they alone inherit the land, even where um, we find in many instances that fathers actually may have chosen the daughter to be the one who's responsible for the family home. Um, married women uh, find and report that they're not treated as people with rights in the land um, because the land is treated as property of their husbands um, and their, their husband's families of birth. And so wives are not consulted on decisions that regard land, uh, the use of land, transactions over land, um, and basically women are treated as minors in, in their families and in the community. And single women especially struggle to access residential land because it's, um, you know, traditionally residential sites are allocated only to men in patrilineal areas. And that's a lot of customary communities in South Africa. And women then are often excluded from traditional institutions, um, which actually make, get to make these decisions over land distribution and get to make um, dispute resolution decisions, these council meetings where key decisions are taken. Women find that they're not represented in those councils and courts. They're not allowed to address the meetings. And even when they do get to come and address the meetings, often they report being denigrated um, when they're trying to speak or even being ignored. And so uh, traditional courts uh, actually that decide these family and land disputes um, are typically uh, dominated by older men and are perceived um, to favor men over women. And this is both from the testimony of women and men. And all of these issues are impacted by the existing traditional leadership laws, which, as I already mentioned, actually build on the legacy of apartheid rather than dismantling it in key ways. So those familiar with apartheid laws will recognize the names of two key pieces of legislation, the Native Administration Act of 1927 and the Bantu Authorities Act of 1951. Parts of the Native Administration Act, which we now refer to as the Black Administration Act, continues to apply today. Um, these parts continue to apply today and are relevant as they regulate uh, dispute resolution in, in, many tr in traditional communities today because they have yet to be repealed. However, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead and start with the Bantu Authorities Act, which by the time it was repealed in 2010, was known as the Black Authorities Act. This legislation put in place two central key elements of apartheid, tribal boundaries for so-called tribes and tribal authorities to govern over the black people organized into those so-called tribes and confined to so-called Bantustans or homelands. <clears throat> 
To the tribal leaders and authorities that secured government recognition, they received, um, they were given extensive and often unaccountable powers. So you fast forward to 2013, um, sorry, to 2003, and the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act came into being, continuing the recognition of tribal boundaries and authorities, as well as the principle of relatively unaccountable governance powers for traditional leaders and traditional authorities, which were then renamed traditional councils. And this foundational legislation would go on to form uh, the foundation of the Communal Land Rights Act as the you know, TLGFA was named the Framework Act. And so the Communal Land Rights Act of 2004 um, built on it because it was its tribal boundaries that were the premise upon which traditional land would be communally owned and its tribal authorities who would administer the land for the community. Yet in 2010, uh, when the CLRA was challenged, it was struck down by the Constitutional Court, primarily because the public had not been sufficiently consulted by the legislature when it tried to replace the living law observed by ordinary communities um, that observe customary law. And actually, as the court said at the time, in the words of Chief Justice Ngobo, um, who wrote his judgment on behalf of a unanimous court, quote, the Black Authorities Act gave the state president the authority to, to establish with due regard to native law and custom tribal authorities for African tribes as the basic unit of administration in the areas to which the provisions of CLARA apply. It is these tribal authorities that have now been transformed into traditional councils for the purposes of Section 28.4 of the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act. And in terms of Section 21 of CLARA, these traditional councils may, councils may exercise powers and perform functions relating to the administration of communal land. And I'm going to come back to this point about um, transformation of, of these institutions into traditional councils, because that is very much contested, as you will see. In any case, putting it more succinctly during oral arguments, Justice Museneke opined um, in the same case to use the Black Authorities Act of 1951 as a platform for land reform after 1994 is simply incredible. Yet the government has been unrelenting in the face of objections from the public. And so um, it has proceeded with its plans. And in fact, even before Tongwane was even decided, um, the government then went ahead and introduced the Traditional Courts Bill of 2008, which built on the same framework of leadership and boundaries um, that is in the TLGFA. It had also not engaged the public in a robust process of consultation, even as it gave um, traditional leaders unaccountable lawmaking and dispute resolution powers. So basically, it continued this legacy of sort of giving traditional leaders greater power um, and not recognizing um, the freedoms of uh, ordinary communities in the process, especially their right to participate in deciding who their leaders are, how they should be governed and how their land should be administered. But I want to spend a minute clarifying this link between the uh, uh, Bantu Authorities Act and the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act, because as shown by the amount of time that's taken by the Chief Justice and Tongwane to spell it out, it is really important. Moreover, it might be lost on those who are not as familiar with the laws. So there's this direct line from the sections in the Black Authorities Act that allowed the state president to establish quote unquote tribal authorities that would assist the government appointed quote unquote tribal leader in governing over mixed and matched so-called quote unquote tribes. Um, and Section 28 of the TLGFA, which recognizes those same structures as the traditional councils, traditional leaders, and traditional communities of today, and continues to give them unaccountable, quote unquote, powers, functions, or duties that were indeed, um, as the Bantu Authorities Act recognized and said, conferred or imposed by the apartheid government. Um, this is what we see um, in uh, this continuation between the Bantu Authorities Act and um, Section 28 of the TLGFA. And more precisely, when you look at the language in Section 28, 1 and 3 and 4 um, uh, of the TLGFA, um, you see how it effectively ushers South Africans living in traditional communities into a time of what I quoted Seppo Mazingozi as uh, describing as neo apartheid um, And you actually see this even more visually when you look at the maps that, um, you know, show how South Africa was divided um, before apartheid ended and then um, after the country ended 
um, and entered into a democratic dispensation. The general failure to carry out the elections that the TLGFA envisions will transform and thus democratize traditional councils, and the fact that even where they have taken place, the elections have been very faulty and far from free and fair, all means that the institutions remain largely untransformed. So again, this point of transformation being very debatable. The pre-democratic uh, provisions and ethos of traditional governance in rural areas therefore remains much the same for ordinary women and men in many parts of the country, even now, a quarter of a century after apartheid formally ended. And this issue of traditional spaces being largely untransformed from a gender politics perspective has been most pronounced in debates over the traditional courts bill. From its first draft introduced in the National Assembly in 2008 and then reintroduced in the National Council of Provinces in 2012, and now the revised draft of, of um, 2017, which is nearing the final stages of promulgation by Parliament. Yet all along, the issue that has drawn the most contestation has been the question of whether ordinary rural people may choose to have their conflicts decided by traditional courts or choose to opt out of having their conflicts decided by traditional courts. And the government's commitment to preserving the central tenets of apartheid legislation, that is leaders, boundaries and authorities that are recognized by the government rather than by the people they govern, that has continued to bedevil the passing of the traditional courts bill up till today. And who best to testify to the true nature, meaning and impact of the Bantu authorities institutions that the government has chosen to perpetuate and protect over indigenous forums of democracy um, that continue to be raised by ordinary people when they're fighting these repressive traditional authorities and laws that support them in many parts of the country than the elders who led the struggle against apartheid. And so I just briefly want to turn to these quotations um, from the likes of Ch uh, Chief Albert Lutuli, who wrote in 1962, the modes of government proposed are a caricature. They are neither democratic nor African. The act makes our chiefs quite straightforwardly and simply into minor puppets and agents of the big dictator. They are answerable to him and to him only never to their people. The whites have made a mockery of the type of rule we knew. Their attempts to substitute dictatorship for what they have efficiently destroyed do not deceive us. And, you know, as as though that weren't enough, uh, Governor Becky went on to write in 1964, many chiefs and headmen found that once they had committed themselves to supporting Bantu authorities, an immense chasm developed between them and the people. Gone was the old give and take of tribal concepts and in its place, there was now the autocratic power bestowed on the more ambitious chiefs who became arrogant in the knowledge that government might was behind them. And in fact, their words were building upon what had been noted in rather unequivocal terms by Nelson Mandela himself, actually descended of would-be traditional leadership because uh, indeed his um, grandson is now a traditional leader in the Eastern Cape. He wrote in 1959, in South Africa, we all know full well that no chief can retain his post unless he submits to fervot. And many chiefs who sought the interest of their people before position and self-advancement -advance have, like President Lutuli, been deposed. And so the proposed Bantu authorities will not be in any sense of the term representative or democratic. And so how is it that in post-apartheid democratic South Africa, these inherently undemocratic institutions have continued to survive. Well, I think that I have shown that um, uh, this is how the gender and traditional government and justice um, issues perhaps most represent the ways in which South Africans find themselves living in a time of neo-apartheid. Um, and frankly, every supposed effort the government makes to unclench the fist that is apartheid's hold on traditional institutions mostly serves to tighten what is proving to be, I regret to say very literally, a death grip on the lives of ordinary rural South Africans. And this you can see evident in the Traditional and Khoisan Leadership Act, which was passed in 2019 and signed by President Cyril Ramaphosa. Even after masses of rural people marched to the union buildings to hand him a letter asking him not to sign it into law for all the reasons that my colleagues and I are setting out for you today. That said, the law has not yet come into force. Um, 
You can also see this hegemony of apartheid construct evident in the Traditional Courts Bill of 2017, whose approval the National Council of Provinces is currently in the process of finalizing. The jury is still out whether it will ultimately prove true of the Communal Land Tenure Bill of 2017. Yet, if the uh, best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, then we have reason to believe that the government is committed to further entrenching apartheid, even as it uses the language of rights and constitutionalism and claims to be advancing democracy and the protections given to poor rural people by the constitution. With that background, I'll now hand over to my colleagues to share case studies of how this reality plays out for rural, um, vulnerable and struggling communities on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sindizo. We'll go straight into uh, Nolundi's presentation. I wanted to ask anyone who has questions to either put them in the chat or uh, keep them in the back of your uh, back of your head. We'll do the three presentations because they they're so much interlinked, and then we'll have uh, a Q and A and a conversation. Nolundi, go ahead. Thanks, Janine. Um, uh, my thanks to uh, the organizers and to Janine uh, for the invitation to join today's conversation. Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity that we all get to be uh, in conversation with each other um, on something that is incredibly topical uh, and very current. Indeed, as uh, Cindy so points out, uh, the National Council of Provinces was dealing with the Traditional Courts Bill this morning, uh, and so they have approved it, and it uh, makes its way back to the National Assembly for the final steps in that process. So certainly uh, an incredibly topical and, and current um, point. Um, the uh, the input that I'd like to make uh, to the conversation is really just to speak uh, to some of these issues um, from the perspective of considering traditional authority, uh, land and mining, and really speaking about uh, some of the challenges and questions that arise at that nexus um, between uh, traditional authorities and the type of powers uh, that are being handed to them in relation to land rights and what that means in a context where um, many rural communities uh, live in a, a rather ironic position of having their land um, be the place in which there are very rich mineral deposits um, and that obviously leads to uh, a particular boom and push in mining as a form of development and so really I, I just want to frame my input uh, around three questions um, the first being to speak very briefly uh, about the nature of people's rights under uh, customary law in particular when it comes to land and I do that in order to then juxtapose it with uh, the second question, which is the impact of the types of powers um, that the state-sponsored laws that uh, Cindy Sue was referring to uh, are giving to traditional authorities and what that means uh, for the types of rights that people hold to their land under customary law. And then lastly, um, to ask the question, what is at stake here uh, if these um, challenges, these, these concerns are not addressed? And really, uh, in speaking to that question, um, I'd like to speak specifically and, and briefly about um, some of perhaps the most well-known uh, instances where we've seen the struggles that occur where uh, you have an intersection between the roles of traditional authorities, people trying to defend their land rights, um, and uh, the approach um, of imminent mining activity. Speaking to that first question then, um, there is a lot of rich uh, and useful scholarship that really gives us an understanding of the types of rights that people hold to their land uh, under customary systems. And key amongst these articulations is this indication that the basis upon which these customary systems of land rights were based were about the responsibilities that were owed between people uh, who had associations with each other through long-term relationships and whether those were uh, relationships of kinship or relationships of marriage. And so really what the literature uh, points to is a system of land rights that is very vested in relationships, as opposed to being vested in notions of someone having absolute control and being able to exercise rights um, over that piece of property uh, against the world. And so uh, the customary law systems were less concerned with the idea of an individual's right to a certain interest in something against a wider public, but rather one's entitlement to property 
um, was thought less uh, in terms of an interdict or a vindicatory action, and more in this, uh, along the lines of this idea of an entitlement to property that arose from obligations um, related to family relationships and your role in decision making. And really, this uh, this particular articulation of a customary land system points and uh, really foregrounds the fact that an understanding of customary law uh, prior to the, the various distortions that we would have seen uh, through the colonial and apartheid system was one that allowed families and communities to adapt and respond to conditions as they arose. Um, and of course, one isn't trying to paint these systems as being perfect uh, in the ways and in the forms that they arose, but certainly uh, I would push to acknowledge that there was a flexibility around land rights, um, that the laws that are currently being imposed and the types of powers that are being afforded traditional authorities undermine and actually uh, seek to do away with. And so the nature of customary land rights centered around relationships that would have adapted um, as the nature of the economy and social structures shifted, but for, of course, the interruptions um, that are well recorded in our history and, and those interruptions being colonialism and apartheid. And so uh, I use this quote really to, to make the point quite succinctly. Uh, it's a, a quote from uh, Professor Ben Cousins, and he writes that the exercise of any right uh, in relation to land was always limited by obligations and counterbalanced by the rights and privileges of, of others. Individual security was great, provided that the necessary respect for the ethical code of the group was maintained. Often, a number of social personalities exercised rights and claims in the same piece of land, and land tenure was both communal and individual, and can be seen as a system of complementary interests held simultaneously. And so the, the point really that I, I am trying to articulate here is that this was a system within which there was an ebb and a flow, there was a give and a take, um, that your ability to uh, exercise your rights to land were naturally controlled and restricted by the needs and rights of others. And for women in particular, this is an important element of the system and an element of the system that often can uh, provide some protection. So the knowledge that uh, where a family had perhaps decided to accommodate um, female members of, of that family, um, the rights that the sons could assert, the rights that others could assert would have to give way and would have to accommodate um, the ability and the claims that could be made by sisters, wives, mothers, daughters. So really uh, a system that uh, was inherently flexible and that had elements uh, of dem democracy within it. And so I come then to the question as to what is the impact of the types of powers that are being given to traditional authorities. Uh, recent state-sponsored law, as uh, Cindy so has indicated to us, really seeks to adopt a model that centralizes authority and decision-making in the person of the traditional leader or in the, um, the body of the traditional council. And of course, the examples here um, are the Communal Land Tenure Bill and the Traditional Inquest and Leadership Act, as Cindy so alluded to. And what this does really is that it unsettles the balance uh, that exists within customary land rights systems. Um, it means that the exercise of power is no longer limited by the obligations that are owed to other people. And this model perhaps is, is most uh, clearly illustrated by the communal land tenure uh, bill, which at this point in time proposes a model that would make the traditional leader or the traditional council the owner of what they refer to as the outer boundary. So they would own effectively uh, the largest and sort of most powerful title to the land and people who lived within the jurisdictional boundaries, as Cindy so showed us on the maps, of those traditional councils or traditional leaders would not necessarily hold ownership rights to their land, but rather they would have secondary rights such as use rights um, to the uh, pieces of land. And effectively what that does is that it downgrades customary uh, ownership rights or customary land rights that are of equal status to ownership to a secondary right of being either a use right um, and in some cases uh, perhaps less than that. And so what you're seeing is you're really seeing a misunderstanding and an overemphasis of the role that's played by traditional authorities when it comes to land administration. So rather than seeking to draft legislation uh, in post-apartheid South Africa that reflects the more inherently democratic elements of customary land holding systems, we're seeing 
the state adopt an approach and a model that really centralizes um, and restricts the inherent flexibility. And of course, the, the question, uh, or at least the, the reality uh, that this leads to, is that it disempowers rural communities and it significantly undermines their land rights um, and places them in a position where the rights that they would have held, uh, which as I've said, are akin to ownership, are being downgraded. And in a way, it is a form of dispossession. And so it's really uh, quite, um, uh, one would almost want to say comical, if it wasn't a, perhaps a tragic comedy, um, that in the very course of trying to effect land reform, the state is actually affecting a model that ends up dispossessing people, that ends up placing them um, in a position of less security rather than more security. Uh, and it's important to note that the Communal Land Tenure Bill would be a piece of legislation that would seek to address one of the three legs of land reform. It would be passed as part of the tenure security security uh, leg of the land reform program as um, uh, required by section 25 of the constitution and specifically by sections 25 subsection 6 and subsection 9 of the constitution. And so uh, I would argue that these types of powers and this model that adopts this uh, vested interest in centralizing power does not facilitate accountability or really a meaningful form of development. And so it leaves communities with very little option um, uh, other than to resort to court action. And in many instances, court action can actually heighten tensions. Um, not only is uh, the, the legal system difficult to access for communities that live some distance um, from urban centers, we know that the wheels of justice turn slowly. And so even as one might use the court system as a mechanism uh, for perhaps seeking relief, things can be happening on the ground and in reality, even as the court process uh, is churning along. And so it offers an avenue to push back against these types of models, but it certainly doesn't offer um, a perfect uh, avenue. And so I come then to the third question, uh, which is this question about what is at stake if things are not addressed. I think that, uh, you know, colleagues who, who perhaps have an interest in this um, area might be familiar with some of the examples that I have listed on the slide, um, but we see in absolute living color in, uh, you know, in present reality, that the costs of pushing back against these types of um, models of centralized authority and the cost of pushing back against an idea of development um, that is very much uh, sort of um, takes this narrative that mining can only possibly be good for a community. How on earth and why on earth would any community not want this form of development really makes people incredibly vulnerable and it makes uh, communities that object vulnerable and it makes individuals who um, act as defenders of community rights incredibly vulnerable and so the cost in uh, in very frank terms is in some instances people's lives um, and as uh, those who follow um, these events would know in Kolobeni and the Eastern Cape um, uh, colleagues who are involved in that struggle um, or Siposipko uh, Bazooka Khadebe, um, lost his life in the struggle against mining. Um, and recently in Somkele in KwaZulu Natal, Umamu uh, Figile Njanga also lost her life. Um, and she was also part of a movement uh, that was against the expansion of a, a mine in their area. And so even as the, uh, the struggle plays out in the political sphere, there is um, a very real cost that's being borne by the communities that oppose this type of development and that oppose these models um, of law that centralize the decision-making uh, powers. And so communities are caught in this very unsustainable equation of either defending their rights to land or being in support of so-called development. Um, and of course, this pits community members against each other. Uh, it frequently pits individuals against their communities and really heightens tensions in a context where people are already insecure when it comes to tenure, in a context where many of these communities are amongst some of the poorest um, in the country. You really are taking on this challenge of should you wish to assert yourself and to defend your land rights uh, against what is effectively effectively a form of rampant disposition, uh, dispossession, you are effectively standing between your community and what might be billed um, by those who present the mining deal as a payday. 
And of course, the question is, how do these community members then secure themselves when the law is so out of reach and when it really doesn't consider the impact that it has on power relations? To insert a legal model that centralizes the decision making around a traditional leader into this context is really to put a match to the tinder. Because what you're doing is you are removing from people the ability that they currently have, as tenuous as it is, to assert that they are owners of the land and to assert that they therefore have the right to consent as to whether or not they want this mining and uh, to assert um, what it is that they would deem to be an adequate uh, and acceptable form of compensation were they to lose uh, pieces of their land in order to allow the expansion of mining. If you take that away and you place those types of decision-making powers solely in the hands of a traditional authority, whether that's a traditional leader or a traditional council, as owner of the land, you really are setting up an absolute uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, what is the word, uh, conveyor belt, if you will, um, where the outcome on the other end uh, is the dispossession of people um, and the disempowerment of communities that are already feeling the brunt of many of the struggles that South Africa sits with. And so this loss, um, I would argue that this, uh, this adoption of this type of model is also a, a kind of a loss of the opportunity to build on and expand the already existing democratic elements of customary law and of these customary land tenure systems. Uh, rather than using this moment to uh, emphasize those elements that are democratic, to build on them, to make them part of the living law, um, that is the, the form of customary law that our constitutional court um, has said that we recognize, the state is choosing to pull in the opposite direction and to move towards recognizing and endorsing a form of uh, of customary law that is less democratic, that is more and more removed from how people live their lives and realities, um, and that also puts people in these invidious positions where they have to make these almost impossible choices. And so in closing, really, I, I just want to take the opportunity to say that I think it is the responsibility of those of us um, who have the ability to sort of understand and to see these challenges, uh, to lend our support to the communities that are uh, exerting their voices and that wish to speak against a form of development um, and sort of economic benefit that isn't actually geared to be in their best interests. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank very you much, Nolani. Just open up my own PowerPoint again. Yes. Oh, this file already exists. Yes, I don't mind. Just open it. Um, so I think what, what we've heard so far is really a story about a struggle over um, expanding the power of chiefs and that struggle is going on. I think we can see that very clearly, uh, both at the national level, at the legislature and at the local level. Um, and at the local level, I think the story, again, is most well known for communities with very valuable natural resources, which is very much the story Noluni was just telling us. Uh, and that is probably also the area where, where people are really, really bearing the brunt of that. Um, Yes, this is where I wanted to go. Um, but there's another aspect to it in, in communities where obviously land is always an important resource, but where there aren't particularly valuable natural resources like extractive resources, where we still see very strong struggles over um, the position of traditional leaders and over the extent to which they can influence lower levels of, of leadership as well, over village leadership. And this is the example I wanted to get into. And it's based on research I've been doing with Tiana Duda, who is uh, Noluni's colleague at the Land and Accountability Research Center at UCT. Um, and let me start by saying that there are people, of course, and there are places where uh, the the moves to strengthen chieftaincy is also welcomed, right? Some people do see chieftaincy as an answer to to their need to belong and to be different. Um, they they might see it as uh, a response to dissatisfaction with elected local government institutions, um, or they might be fighting. Uh, to get rid of a traditional leader, but not because they find something wrong with the system, but because they feel that the current traditional leader might be an imposed one 
um, and uh, they rather have a different one that they consider as their own or legitimate. Um, and then, of course, within that, there's still the whole story of how much power they have. But even outside of those areas, there's also areas where um, there are many detractors of this idea of uh, enhancing, spreading uh, uh, traditional leadership. And this is, for instance, the case in parts of the former Siskai area of the Eastern Cape. And this area, the history of it, is very much characterized by many forced removals, uh, land dispossessions, betterment schemes. Um, and all of that resulted in communities made up of people from diverse origins without really uh, shared traditional leadership structure, structures. Um, and the position of chiefs on these communities during the apartheid era uh, was met with heavy local resistance. Um, and actually we see similar types of existence to ongoing current attempts to again, extend the role and power of chiefs in those areas. So I wanted to share with you one of the two case studies that Tiani and I have been looking at, which is um, the case study of Case Kemahook South, um, where the struggle really is about who has the power to appoint village leaders. Is that the chief or the royal family or traditional council? Or on the other hand, is it local communities? Um, and connected to that question, is it um, the, the accountability of those village heads? Does that lie downward to the community members or does it lie upward to the chief? Now, like in many areas of South Africa, uh, Kais Kamahuk has a history of changing occupation. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, the Khoi Khoi pastoralists who inhabited the area were ousted by the Kosa who expanded from their territory east of the Great Kai River. Um, but then after uh, the Nanjeni War in 1853, uh, the Kosa chief of the area, who has a name that I can't pronounce because I still haven't learned how to pronounce all the clicks, but Nkrika, um, he, um, he and his followers were expelled by the British colonial forces uh, and the area was added to the Cape Colony as a royal reserve. And the colonial government then allowed groups of Mfengu people to settle on these conquered lands, as well as actually a small number of Europeans, which they saw as the combination as creating a buffer, and I quote, in order to separate the colonists from the war like Gaza, unquote. Um, so these Mfengu, their ancestors largely originated in areas taken over by the Zulu Kingdom and Natal during the Mfikane, and fled to Kosa country around 1818, 1828. Um, and some became fully absorbed in Southern Nguni communities. Others lived more semi-autonomously in a client-patron relationship with local chiefs. Um, and the colonial government was able to play on Mfingu grievances about uh, servitude and exactions uh, demanded of them by the Kosa to draw them into anti-Kosa alliances. Um, and as a result, some of the Mfengu groups, um, Mfengu groups collaborated with the colonial government in the frontier wars, which is the reason they were rewarded with these portions of land that formerly were uh, lived on by the Kaza. So going back to Case Kamehuk South, um, this is basically the story also of an Mfengu community. And these groups came with their own leaders but very diverse, so more at village level, there was uh, each had their own leaders and the government largely in the beginning recognized these village headmen uh, who were chosen by the people, although they had to be approved by the government. Um, they usually followed, the government usually followed the, the locally selected candidate. Um, there was a little bit more interference at the time of the betterment schemes um, because, and that was 1950s, 60s, because um, government really wanted headmen who were pro-betterment. But in general, um, a lot of local uh, say over who these um, headmen were. Um, and no leadership structures above, no shared traditional leadership structures above that village level. Now, this changes a bit in 1951 with the Bantu Authorities Act that was already mentioned by Sindizu, um, which introduced um, tribal authorities as the pillar of its apartheid system. But it also recognized that for areas with highly diverse communities, um, that these might not have a common ethnically defined leader. So the law for those communities provided um, that they could have community authorities instead of tribal authorities. 
Uh, and that was, for instance, what happened in a number of those in Pengu communities and also in uh, Case Kamaluk South. So a community authority was created in 1966. This again changed in uh, 1979. Um, when the Siskayan president Sebe transformed the community authority, which was headed by Inumfengu, into a tribal authority, which was rather headed by a Kaza. Now, why was this happening? You need to have a little bit of historical background for this. Siskai was granted self-government, internal self-government in 1972, uh, and the legislature consisted of elected members as well as chief. Now, to the extent that people identified with um, pre-colonial categories, these were largely Kharharbe, Kaza, and Mfengu. And the tensions between these two groups were uh, persisted into the 20th century, partly because of this history of fighting uh, of the Amamfengu on the side of uh, the colonial government, but partly also because the Amamfengu were singled out for more education, they were more absorbed into missions, um, they therefore held the majority of salaried positions and headmanship. So they, they were used in a sort of divide and rule way. So what happens in the first election of uh, internal self-government, uh, Siskai, is that there is a strong rivalry between a mainly Mthengu supporters group and a mainly Gaza supporters group. And the latter group wins with a slight margin, and according to a number of research, is probably due to governmental interference in the elections. Um, and of course, the new government led by Chief Minister Lennox Sebe then sets about reducing the power of the Mfengu. Now, at the time, the majority of the recognized chiefs were Mfengu, and the chiefs outnumbered the elected members in the legislature. So the first thing that Sabre's government went after was trying to get control of chieftaincy positions. Now, one way was by creating new chieftaincy positions, which was possible uh, because of the, the consolidation and, and, and some new areas were added, people that was influx. So um, it was possible to create new chieftaincies because there were new territories and new followings. But in addition, the Siskai government did that by converting these community authorities into tribal authorities. Um, and so all in all, after the 1973 elections, eight, nine new chieftaincy uh, chiefs were created, eight of whom were Kharharba Kaza, and one was Nfingu chieftaincy, and all of which were Seba supporters. Okay, back to Keskamahuk South again. Uh, in 1979, this is what happened. The community authority was just changed into a tribal authority. And this, the new chief, the new traditional uh, authority, tribal authority, influenced the selection of headmen, uh, although the magistrate retained a final say. Um, and both the chief and his elected headman became very unpopular. So, um, when in the 1980s the opposition uh, to, to Siskai rule becomes strong, this includes strong resistance against the imposition of both the chiefs and unpopular headmen. Then in 1980, when Seba, Lennox Seba, gets ousted by Brigadier Kozo in 1990, as I said, um, this new, new guy, he um, abolished the headmen and immediately this was taken up locally and all the headmen lost their position. And when a year later the government decided to reintroduce them because the response had actually been a little bit too enthusiastic, um, this was heavily resisted, the reintroduction of these headmen, heavily resistant in his area, including like burning down houses of, of, of headmen, etc. And, and most communities continue to organize in the form of local residence associations. And according to Manona, the tribal authority by then was virtually non-existent. Okay, quite a lot of history, but you need this to understand um, the present. Um, so what happens post-independence? The position of the chief survives, but it meant very little for most people in the area. It had very little practical impact on their lives, on village life. Uh, villages were largely governed through elected village heads and through civics. And then this starts to change in the early 21st centuries. We get new struggles over the right of communities to elect or select their own village heads. 
uh, and they can be clearly traced back to one of the laws we've talked about earlier, the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act. Um, and this section is actually on two slides. So the EC version of this act um, describes the, I mean, oh, uh, describes the, um, it says in section 18 that whenever the position of an incosio incosana, which you can translate as headman, is to be filled, it's the royal family concerned who must, with due regard to applicable customary law, identify a person who qualifies in terms of customary law to assume the position in question. So what's happening here is that um, the royal families, the chiefs, the traditional councils are pointing to this section to make the argument that it's actually the royal family who has to select headmen, even though some of these communities have been doing that for a very long time, except perhaps uh, a short period of uh, imposed headmen by Seba. They're making an additional argument, and that is that this headman that they choose has to come from Hill, from the royal family itself. And for that, they're pointing to the use of the term Inkosana, Inkosana in easy causa means prince. Now, with that, they're saying it's a prince, so it has to be a person from the royal family. Nevertheless, legally, there's no argument for this. If we look at section one of the EC, uh, Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act, they say an Inkosana is a headman or a headwoman as defined by the National Framework Act. And the National Framework Act just says Headmanship is the position held by a headman or a headwoman. So legally, there's no argument for this. Obviously, you can all understand that by using the local term for prince, it's easy for traditional leaders uh, and traditional authorities to make this argument that they are the ones to select and that the headman should come from the royal family. Um, So uh, I have an interesting quote by a local activist who says, it's a false construction. Inkosana means prince, male child of a chief. With this term, they change headmen into princes through linguistic construction. Now, this is what I call the, the royalization, disputes over the royalization of village leadership. And we see them in many areas, uh, other areas of the Eastern Cape as well. And we can't get into that. I just wanted to report very briefly about one particular case. Uh, that made it to the courts and it was also heavily uh, reported on, which is the Kala Reserve case um, situated in the former Transkai district, district of Kalanga. And what happens in this case is that in court, the appellants, which were the chief and the traditional council, but also the premier of the EC, of the Eastern Cape, and the MEC for local government traditional affairs, they argued that the royal family did take into account existing customary practices in identifying the new headman because he's a member of the royal family. So they're equating customary law uh, regarding selection of headman with just following the lines of royalty. So anything you know, that has to do with the royal family is automatic customary. And another interesting argument, lawyers appearing for provincial authorities, so not even for the tribal authorities, but for the provincial authorities, um, argued in court that the laws did not require the popular views of the community to be taken into account, nor envisage community consultations. This, this goes quite far, right? This is the government saying that it doesn't matter what the people, what the people think of this and whether they agree with this, nor whether it's in line with our customary law, because it is in customary law, in line with the customary law, as long as it's done by the royal family. And the judge then also concluded, um, uh, he pointed out that both the Framework Act and the EC Governments Act state that the institution of traditional leadership must be transformed so that democratic governments and the values of an open and democratic society may be promoted. This comes from both, uh, both acts. Um, and the, the, um, the community was able to show that they had over 100 years of uh, history of electing their own um, their own community leaders, um, and the judge concluded the practice of electing headmen in that district is part of the customary law of that community. Now, let me conclude on this. What what do we take from this? Um, I think 
these these disputes over this royalization of village leadership really clearly demonstrate again in line with what my two colleagues have been saying the impetus that legislation provides for chiefs fight for for Ubukazi, chiefs fight for more power uh, for chiefs um, and we see that the Eastern Cape administration largely supports this, either in action or in inaction, but they very um, uh, uh, reluctantly, uh, if at all, choose the side of the communities that complain that this is not in line with our customer law, that they don't have this history. Um, and the issue with this Governance Act, the Traditional Leadership Governance Framework Act and the EC, the Eastern Cape version of it, is not just about who gets to select a village head on the one hand, and does that person need to hail from the royal family? The communities were pointing out that it's much broader about um, whether belonging to a traditional community is optional or not. So respondents really um, reported to us that when the framework Act was introduced in 2003, it was a very limited consultation of rural people. That's again a theme we see with most of these laws. Um, and that many of them did not want to be a traditional community with a traditional council. And the Act allows communities to choose, to, to, to opt out, to choose to become a traditional community or not. But none of these people were given the opportunity to say that they didn't want to be a traditional community. Uh, and many villages and many villagers uh, boycotted the election for those 40% of the elected uh, traditional councillors, which did take place in a way, but had extremely low voter turnout because people didn't feel they were legitimate and they weren't about something that they wanted anyhow. Um, so this law is much broader. It's really also about attempts to create traditional communities. And it's very much about the centralization of local power in the hands of senior traditional leaders. And despite the fact that these are areas where there aren't very clear, highly valuable natural resources, people were very worried uh, what this would mean if chiefs um, would get more of a say over their local leaders. So they were really questioning why in times of democracy, why living in democratic South Africa, post-apartheid South Africa, they would have to change from downwardly accountable tradition, uh, downwardly accountable elected village leaders who were elected for a, a period, a term, back to positions for life of people who were upwardly accountable, not to the community, but to the chief, um, while they were afraid even of what that chief would be, would do, would mean, would try to get their hands on in the community. Um, so I think that's my conclusion, um, and I think that means we can open the floor to some questions, either on the chat or asking them out loud. I think there was a question from um, MC Canfield. I think it was to... Um, Asking, have uh, the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of Tenur been used or discussed in this context? Uh, Nolundi, if you could address that. Sure. Um, so the voluntary guidelines um, have been discussed. I don't think that they've been used, although I suppose one could argue that that particular interpretation of them has been used. Um, certainly, uh, many of the networks that work on uh, rural land struggles have consistently brought the, the VGTs uh, to the attention of the government. Um, and in their own research and uh, sort of um, uh, uh, study trips to other parts of both the continent, but also to other countries, um, the department that's responsible for drafting uh, the, the land-related legislation um, has certainly engaged with uh, the voluntary guidelines. Um, as I say, I think that uh, perhaps the argument that I would make is that it's a particular interpretation of the voluntary guidelines rather than one that's necessarily um, resulting in a legal framework that um, looks particularly friendly for the lived struggles of the rural communities. And would you like to comment on um, what Linda said about um, this information that's needed um, on community level um, to advocate for, for land? 
Sure, I mean, I would I would agree uh, with uh, with Glenda's um, suggestion. I think uh, you know part of the work that we do, um, and uh, part of the work that uh, that both Janine and, and Cindy have done with us, is about trying to get this information into the hands of communities, um, both so that they can advance uh, their struggles to assert their land rights, uh, to hold the authorities uh, uh, accountable to um, the various uh, legal restraints and requirements, um, and certainly I think that you know all efforts to make sure that these types of conversations and the information um, that is pitched here doesn't just remain uh, in these types of spaces, but reaches the, the very people who are most impacted is, is absolutely central. Can I just jump in right there um, with Nolundi's comment? I, I fully agree with what Nolundi said. Um, I think maybe part of the challenge if, if is... Other Go ahead. OK, sorry. Um, I think part of the challenge is that, um, you know, I mean, I think LARC and other organizations, the Alliance for Rural Democracy, for instance, have um, uh, been working really hard to get this information out there. But the challenge is really structural, right? Like, I mean, uh, like communities, even when they have the information, do not get given the opportunities to actually use that information effectively and it's so resource intensive right so you know to the point that Nolundi was making earlier about how you know when um, these conflicts have to go through the courts it means that you know like the tensions bubble even more in the communities like it actually inflames tensions that are happening on the ground but more than that like it's incredibly difficult to get these matters to the courts and it takes a ton of support external support that communities typically don't have access to um and even organizations that support communities in doing this work actually really struggle you know to they have to 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 amass the, the sources, uh, the resources to support this work, and they have to make really difficult decisions about which cases they take forward and which cases they don't. And so I think this is one of those situations where information to communities is absolutely crucial, but um, it's really hard because structurally the situation is such that, you know, traditional leaders are in positions where they get informed well ahead of the community members of what's going to happen. And the community members are constantly on the defensive. And I guess just thinking about the traditional courts bill, so um, Nolundi was pointing out that it, it got passed this morning. Um, you know, one of the issues with the traditional courts bill has been consistently the fact that communities have not been able to um, participate effectively. So even when, you know, LARC and other organizations have extensively, um, you know, made efforts to go out and educate communities about what's going on, inform them and, and get their views, etc., and even help communities to prepare, um, you know, their testimonies for presentation to government. If you look at a process like the NCOP process of consultation around the traditional courts bill, where, you know, they announced that it's going, they're going to be consulting today and, you know, the communities are supposed to be there tomorrow or the day after. And that just makes it really difficult for communities to really participate and actually use the information that they've been given in ways that are going to make a difference. So I guess this is not a, a a statement against you know the need to put this information out absolutely that is you know a, a non-negotiable i guess it's just a call to recognizing the fact that um this the problems are actually much greater than with respect to communities having access to information it's really a matter of how all of the avenues for communities to get to express their will and effect their will are being closed down systematically. Can I can I add two things to that? Um because firstly I for my field work we 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 really found that that the level of organization and the level of resources is you you can't underestimate the difference between that. If you're thinking for instance of mining struggles, then it's the chief who uses those mining resources to find his legal battles while the community who doesn't want that mining basically starts from zero and then gets slapped with punitive uh, costs in some of these cases, which utterly ruins them and really has a very chilling effect on anyone else trying to use the courts. Um, but also, for instance, in, in one mining community, 
the resistance they tried to do was they they went to the mine, they went to the mine, they went to the mine. Finally, they let them in because this is a heavily fortified area, you know, because of sabotage, possibly, etc. Finally, they get in. They tell them about this land that the mine is now working on, which is theirs, and they don't have any deal with that. The mine gives them some kind of story about three people in the village having sold them that land. They can't find the contract. They don't know the names, but we'll get back to you. They never do. They pull money in the community to try and call the mine. They get put on hold by three different people for 45 minutes. The money runs out and that's the end of the resistance. I mean, this is the difference in the level of organization and financial backing that, that these communities versus the mine slash chief slash state, because this is all one big uh, 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 trilogy uh, of corruption, as I remember uh, someone, uh, um, um, I think your your colleague, um, Lundi, um, now I'm losing his name, who who uh, was used to work on the mining. Um, so, um, and, and I think one more point to make is that the courts are really the sought after avenue from these communities that don't know where else to go. But nevertheless, there are also many cases where these courts have played quite a negative role or at least where the chiefs have been able to utilize the courts as well. And there's a really interesting interplay of legal pluralism here uh, where the, the chiefs on the one hand point to customary law as the, the, the source that gives them power to make mining deals on behalf of the communities. Um, but then, of course, they, they the deals that they close with the mining companies have nothing to do with customary law, right? It's about um, it's about contracts and 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 uh, investment companies and taxes and all those kind of things, shares, shareholders. Um, very hard to understand for the elders that play an important role in the traditional uh, authority, the, the, the traditional uh, 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 structures for uh, checks and balances on these chiefs. And when community members try to break through that, have more of a say in it or take it to court, now and then they get told by the court, sorry, you don't have local standy because, you know, this is a traditional issue. So instead of the, you know, the adagium of forum shopping that we know from customary law of, or legal pluralism literature. It's a sort of forum stopping. They're both sending them to the other side while that side is blocking it internally. Um, so it's really, really complicated how all these things come together in combination with a background in resource and um, yeah. Thank you, Janina. And then uh, we have another question from, from Glenda. Um, how does the land access movement of South Africa and the NGOs that could be active in advocacy manage to do this under these economic constraints? Um, and then attached to that question two, what can be done in this case to get it to get info there and thinking about IDPs and other? Um, I don't know who wants to go first um, and add to that. Uh, sure, I could uh, take a stab. <laughs> um, so, I mean, uh, the Land Access Movement um, is uh, an organization, I think, that uh, that we all know well. And uh, the uh, Alliance for Rural Democracy, which uh, Cindy Saw was referring to, works um, quite closely with those Lamosa networks as well. Um, and, of course, Lamosa has also lent their name um, to a, a recent constitutional court judgment. Um, and I think, you know, part of what uh, makes the work that Lamosa uh, does possible um, is this use of networks. So I think that um, La Mosa recognizes uh, the point that I think Janine and, uh, and Cindy saw are making that, you know, without a multi pronged approach, without an approach that recognizes that you're trying to push back against something that's both systemic um, and simultaneously political, because, you know, the, the political networks and the networks of patronage um, also uh, play a critical role here, particularly in the mining context. Um, one needs to then adopt a multi-pronged approach and so it's this combination between advocacy, perhaps litigation in extreme cases, but without a relationship between these mechanisms of trying to push back, um, one really will struggle, um, taking into account uh, the, the very valid points uh, that both Cindy Su and, uh, and Janine have made. And then uh, the sort of second question around, you know, thinking about um, the IDPs and, uh, and other structures, I think part 
part of again the you know the sad irony is that uh, in the type of thinking that our government has, it conceives um, of a very poorly defined but a role nonetheless, a poorly defined role uh, for traditional leaders within the local government sphere. And so, if the uh, um, you know the kind of the reality of a particular community is that their traditional leader occupies this position of power so well described by Janine um, and also you know is the kind of uh, representative if you will within the local government forum it becomes quite difficult to use any of those uh, local government mechanisms those you know IDPs um, and those other kind of municipal uh, type structures and, and forums to surface these issues of course the other part of it is um, I'm not a hundred percent sure that the state <laughs> that all um, arms of the state would agree with the uh, the reading and the articulation that we present here right so of course uh, it's a question of whether or not one even gets to raise um, these issues one even gets to ask these difficult questions um, you know whether or not one even has an opportunity to try and access um, the type of information that could put communities in a better position um, and you know again Janine makes the point that for communities that are embroiled in struggles against mining, access to information, to some of the most basic information, um, can be incredibly difficult. You know, access to seeing the mining license, access to seeing, you know, the notice um, that was put up that shows the intent to grant a mining license. In many instances, um, communities have to litigate to get even that most basic form of information. Um, so it really is a, a tragedy, I would say, that the type of structures that the state conceives of really still adhere so closely to channeling all information um, and all kind of opportunities through uh, the traditional leader. Can I add something to that? First of all, uh, in the, uh, the the region where 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 we, uh, the, the the mining research that I've been doing with Joanna Pickering. Um, um, the, there was a couple of villages that had to relocate and there was a relocation agreement and none of them ever got to see it, not because they didn't try, but just because, oh no, that's with the mine. And the mine says, oh no, yeah, that's with the community. Oh no, that's at the lawyer's office. That's, it's just, unless you get a lawyer involved, you're not going to see your own relocation agreement. But that was not the point I wanted to make. I I was reminded, uh, Nolundi, by what you said, by why I think the case study that I was telling about in the Eastern Cape is important because there's a lot of focus on the, the big mining, right? Where it's clear, I think, why government is also interested in it, right? It's, it's, um, it has everything to do with the BEE, right? The Black Economic Empowerment with the fact that these big mining companies need to have a certain percentage of shares in the hands of formerly disadvantaged South Africans which is a huge economic boon for a, a, a small group of new uh, 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 rich black entrepreneurs who are revolving doors in and out with, with government and with local government. So there it's very clear why I think the EC case study is interesting because it shows how thick, and I haven't really told you about that part, but in all of these cases, the government just follows whatever the chief is saying, whatever the traditional council is saying, whatever the royal family is saying, and they're not, they, they basically don't stand up to people at all. And it shows you that even when there isn't too much at stake in the sense of natural resources, they're thick as thieves. They're, uh, they, they just do the same unless courts stop them, unless there's such a big local revolt that they have to respond. But it shows you that at this moment, that connection is very real and very strong. So I, I think that really brings that out because it's not a case of, of huge natural resources. Just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I actually was going to say the same thing, Janine. So I really appreciate you bringing that um, to the fore because, you know, I've done work in Bumalanga and in KZN and in places where actually there hasn't been all of this conflict around mining. Um, and yet, um, you know, when I have witnessed IDP processes and I've witnessed um, traditional leader engagements with the government representatives, it is so deferential, right? Like traditional leaders walk in and it's like, you know, <laughs> it's, ah, it isn't, right? Like it's, it's um, you know, basically people kind of step out of the way and what have you. And so there isn't actually this space, right, politically, socially, um, to actually like raise these kinds of critical um, 
perspectives or questions because the assumption is invariably that traditional leaders are in fact the representation of our culture. So when we're talking about customary law, when we're talking about um, you know uh, culture, they are as as is often banded about, they are the custodians of our culture, they are the custodians of our land, right? And so that means that we cannot question them because they are a power in and of themselves and they are the ultimate authorities. They are the final say on what is and isn't true in terms of what is custom. And that's a strong card to play, right? That culture custom card in the whole post-1994 and, and there hasn't been all the change that we want and we want to go to a true African South Africa. I think that's a very strong card to play, even though what they're saying and what they're doing, you know, is opposite. It's very hard to argue against that. And I think that really makes the, 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 the activism of, of Lark and others really more complicated. Thank you, Janina and Sindiso. Um, if anybody has got, oh, I see there's another question coming through. Um, so, Glenda comments. Uh, thank you, Nolindi, Sindiso, and Janina for responding to the questions. Your presentations are outstanding. They are. I wish they would uh, percolate into our leadership too and be actioned accordingly. Power is ugly. Where deprivation exists only for a few, the very fat cats, corruptibles, and capitalists are. <laughs> uh, we have to make a way for humanity in this country, and land is the ultimate for development as freedom. So um, I'd like to invite everybody um, who's still got questions to please raise them now. I know what Sheila Makananise, I saw your hand was up. I don't know if you still have a question or whether it was answered um, during these discussions that we just had. Yes, Megan, I, I do have a question. Uh, my Go question, ahead. yes. Uh, I, uh, my question will be directed to um, uh, Cindy So as well as uh, Nolundi. Uh, first, uh, Cindy So highlighted that uh, South Africa is a neo apartheid uh, state uh, in a presentation. I wanted to uh, understand on what can be, uh, what needs to be done in order to transform or to reverse some of the acts which were enacted during the time of. Apartheid. Uh, that's the first question. And then um, to Nolundi, the question it's about um, the, the 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 very controversial topic uh, the about the land uh, uh, land redistribution without compensation. On uh, it is something which is already on the plate because the parliament has already uh, reviewed and has done the community uh, has visited community in order to amend section 25 of the constitution. So I want to understand what, um, do you think that the community has enough voice in order to inform the laws and policies of the country? Are community given, are they given enough uh, uh, space in order to, 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 to make their, their, uh, their voice to be heard? I mean, Statistic wise, uh, the land is still uh, in the hands of few whites. Uh, uh, I mean, more than 74% uh, of the land uh, still belongs to the white uh, people in South Africa. So, given that uh, stats, do you think that uh, with the current uh, uh, political unwillingness, do you see? uh any equal distribution of resources going forward given the fact that we are already in the 26 uh, years of democracy thank you those will be those are my questions thank you Vuchilo. that's a, a a great question and um i mean i could talk about it for days but i'm gonna <laughs> try and spare everybody um and basically just say that you know i think the problems really can uh, largely 
be sort of attributed to Section 28 of the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act to begin with, um, because of how that section undermined all of what came before in the act. So Janine made the point when she was talking about the TLGFA um, that, you know, communities um, there in the Eastern Cape were saying, you know, but we didn't even really want to be a, a traditional community. Like, you know, they the act says that, you know, we get to choose whether we want to be one or we don't want to be one. But nobody allowed us to give the to, to make the choice as to what as and actually express the fact that we don't want to be one. And, you know, even to the point of what Janine said about, you know, customary communities, um, I'm sorry, community authorities versus traditional authorities under the Black Authorities Act, um, the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act basically has like s sort of silently done away with community authorities and just converted them into traditional authorities. And so here's another instance where you can see that the government made a very deliberate choice to do away with democratic structures that actually exist in traditional communities and um, choose to put in place these more authoritarian structures that are, you know, imposed on people and were imposed on people under apartheid. And so, you know, I think a very simple solution to begin with, right, it's only the start, but to begin with, would be to do away with Section 28 and just let people, and, and do away with all of the boundaries, do away with all of the, the traditional leadership recognitions, et cetera, and start from a blank slate, a blank canvas, and have people get to elect and choose their traditional leaders, get to set their own um, boundaries as to how they want them done and, you know, figure figure out everything basically from scratch. And I think that, you know, we underestimate the um, abilities and capacities of rural communities to be able to make these decisions for themselves. They don't need to be told, you know, that this is the person who must lead you. If people feel that this traditional leader is a person who would lead them well, then they will put that person back into the position of being a traditional authority and they will give them the mandate. Um, so actually, I think that it would have been a very simple thing for the government to do, a scary thing, absolutely. But that's because we're always so scared that things will devolve into absolute mayhem if we allow people to choose. We are so scared of the people's will to be honest, that actually we try to manipulate it by all of these means. And this is just one of those means is that we maintain the enforce the imposed structures under apartheid under the guise of democracy. Uh, thanks for your questions, uh, Vuchilo. Um, to start with uh, the, the controversial one, <laughs> in your own words, uh, the, the question of expropriation without compensation. Um, I mean, I, I think that uh, it's a it's a long argument um, that uh, or perhaps long conversation that one could have um, about EWC. But what I w will say is that you know I think that there are two key questions um, uh, when it comes to uh, the government's sort of uh, adoption of this as a way forward for land reform. The first is I don't know that there's been enough recognition of how resource intensive it, it is and will be um, to effect expropriation without compensation effectively, um, and you know particularly for the rural areas um, where there is still not a clear picture of where, um, you know, who owns sort of what land, um, where there isn't a very clear sense, um, even now, uh, you know, so many years after uh, apartheid, as to which elements uh, and which parts of land, you know, have been transferred to the state, which haven't, um, and to sort of put uh, an EWC and expropriation without compensation approach on top of that, I think can be um, quite a risky move. And, you know, the, the recent uh, announcement by the department um, around the release uh, of um, state land for farming purposes is a is a case in point, right? So some of the land that's actually been released by the state is under. Um, uh, significant uh, restitution claims, uh, land restitution claims by communities who have been waiting for years to have those claims resolved and for them to be granted uh, access to land to which they have uh, a hereditary connection. And so what you're really seeing, I think, in, in those types of examples is an almost kind of political expediency um, 
sitting alongside or perhaps butting heads uh, with the realization that these types of processes are labor intensive. They require, you know, thorough land auditing. They require a thorough understanding of the picture so that you're not inadvertently evicting some or depriving some in order to release land to supposedly advance land reform. You're, you're kind of, you know, stitching and undoing as you go. Um, and then your, your other question was around whether or not I think um, community voices are adequately heard when it comes to legislation legislative processes and lawmaking. Uh, I think Sandiso uh, has given us a, a really um accurate and important uh, framing for, for this question. Um, in her uh, speaking about the traditional and Khoisan Leadership Bill, the Framework Act and the traditional Courts Bill, um, and highlighting that in all of those legislative processes, communities struggle to have their voices heard. And, you know, nowhere does this play out more clearly than in the types of public hearings that are held in rural communities. Um, as Cindy so indicated, people find out about the hearings, you know, a day, maybe two days before. Um, they are having Handed a piece of legislation, you know, the traditional and Khoisan Leadership um, Act is uh, is a hefty piece of law uh, coming in at, at almost 100 pages. Um, people are handed this, you know, this bill uh, on the day of the hearing in a language that perhaps one is not proficient in, predominantly um, English, and are sort of told to engage, you know, speak to us about whether or not you support this law, speak to us about whether or not um, you want this law to pass. Now, there are, you know, some of us in this uh, chat right now in this um, in this event who would struggle to engage on a you know a, an almost 100 page piece of law right now and to speak about whether or not you think that it should be um, passed uh, when it's going to have such uh, sort of widespread um, impact on your rights and so I would say with you know with absolute um, confidence that no I don't think that community voices are heard significantly um, and I don't think that they are afforded the weight that they should carry when it comes to lawmaking uh, not only is it a question of of the way in which people are treated and the way in which um, they are expected to engage, there are also questions of access, right? So even in this uh, moment of COVID-19, where Parliament has gone virtual and digital, um, it's still only the person who has a smartphone and access to data who can, you know, log on and watch uh, the various meetings. So I think that our legislative um, uh, uh, lawmaking processes leave a lot to be desired in terms of how well we're managing to facilitate uh, community voices. I really like how these two questions come together. They weren't posed to me, but I'd, I'd like to say that because if you look at the way forward and at the same time you see that the community voice isn't heard, then of course, you know, that, that really brings it out. And, and what Sindizo was saying really reminded me of something that Peter Delius is writing about. He writes uh, that he laments the comprehensive failure to incorporate the need to secure and sustain popular support for chiefs into post-colonial reform of the institution and it just isn't there i mean if if you know at, at all levels all these different stories that we can tell from different regions from different maybe factual struggles they all they all give you that uh that that impression and and if you look at the the traditional leadership governance framework act it's quite surprising. I mean, maybe we're past that stage. Maybe, you know, it's a 2003 act. We forget to be surprised about it. But in a country where so many people and groups of people have been forcibly moved under different leaders, where hierarchical structures have been created, invented, recreated, where heaps of traditional leaders, you know, almost everyone who resisted and wanted to do well lost its position and others got to be in place, right? This is such a distorted position, and that's what we started out with. And then in 2003, you say, well, we're going to deal with that. We're going to have a traditional leadership commission. We're going to do some reforms. But hey, in the meantime, we're going to formalize. We're going to strengthen exactly that structure with all those communities who don't want to be under those senior traditional leaders. Well, first we put you there, and then we'll talk about whether you really belong there. I mean, that is... You know, the epitome of not listening to people, not listening to the complaints, not taking seriously. Um, so thank you for these two questions, because I think they actually bring that very, very nicely together. Thank you, ladies. Um, I think if there are no further questions, um, I'd just like to wrap up this lecture and um, with one last slide from my end. And I'd like to invite everybody that has studied in the Netherlands or currently studying in the Netherlands um, 
to join our Holland Alumni Network. Uh, at, and now my slide doesn't want to upload. <laughs> um, I'll just I'll put the link in, in the chat box. Um, and I'd like to invite everybody to join the, the Holland Alumni Network at uh, www.hollandalumni.nl and I'll put that chat box right now. Um, and I'd also um, just like to uh, to, uh, um, what I can find there is uh, we have a South African page where you can really have discussions about topics like this and other topics. Um, you could also, there's also opportunities to find um, jobs in the Netherlands. Uh, there you go. Then it's up and running. And you can also um, find uh, interesting articles and events that will take place soon. Um, so if you've got any questions regarding the Holland Alumni Network or this lecture that just take, took place, you're welcome to contact us at info at nesosouthafrica.org. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank Janina, Nolundi and Cindy Diso for your contribution to, to this lecture. It was very insightful and I think everybody enjoyed it. And I just want to also thank all the attendees that joined. I know it's late, it's almost eight o'clock here in South Africa. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for, for all being on and, and being here. Um, and yes, thank you everybody. And can I add to that my thanks to uh, to you, Megan, and to Huba and to to Nezo for uh, organizing this. Uh, it was it was that was very helpful and it led to this really nice setting. So thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Only a pleasure. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye bye, bye, -bye everyone. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Cheers. Cheers.